what we've been hearing from all the public health officials uh, at this point, now that they're finally beginning to uh, grant that uh, that the randomized control trials were too short, that they were indeed shorter even than they were supposed to be, uh, that the efficaciousness uh, that was supposedly demonstrated in them was not quite exactly, and in many ways not at all, what it was that we were told it was. Um, but specifically with regard to safety, increasingly the tune has changed. Right, the tune is no longer, of course, um, of course we did everything that we always do, um, because it's become totally clear that that they didn't. Um, as so, uh, in Oct actually October of 2021, Norman Deutsch published this excellent piece in Tablet, like a three or four part, I don't remember what, um, called Needle Points, uh, which explores what he calls vaccine hesitancy. That's the term that is used. I don't, I don't like it, but um, and it's really, it's really extraordinary. And uh, he also read it aloud on Jordan Peterson's podcast for those who would prefer to to read it. Um, but here in and and a PDF of all of the pieces together is available. So here's a 38 page document that is available if you go to tablet, um, I'll link there, but here's just a PDF of it. Um, three, two thirds of the way through or half the way through, uh, Deutsch writes, still, it was obvious as early as the fall, this would have been, um, sorry, I think this is gonna be fall of 2020. Still, it was obvious as early as the fall that some testing steps would be skipped. We'll have less safety testing than we typically would have, Gates noted. We just don't have the time. And, um, you know, it, that's, that's Bill Gates who said that. He was certainly not the only one of the people pushing the one solution for the massive problem that we are all sharing. Uh, but it's, uh, so, you know, his words are not unique in this regard, but they are telling because this is a rhetorical trick that is becoming the thing that is used against us. Of, you know, first, first there's the lying, the obfuscation, the, you know, of course we did everything according to protocol. Of course these are totally safe. Of course we know. And then if and only if enough people in the public are going like, you know what you couldn't possibly have, here's how I know. And they are forced to reveal that actually there were safety skip, steps skipped or, um, or fudged or whatever it is. Um, then the story we get is, well, of course we did. A, you know, no acknowledgement that they had just lied to you. Of course we did. Of course we skipped some safety, but it's necessary because this is an emergency. And so this is just like freaking Trudeau invoking the Emergencies Act against a bunch of people who were standing up for their freedoms, right? And this is, this is, this is like almost all of the rhetoric that we get back when we resist now. And so before you, be, I'm going to step out outside of this particular conversation for a moment to go to something that seems completely other, um, but it uses the same, it uses exactly the same rhetorical trick. And <clears throat> this is on an issue um, about which, um, you know, we, we actually do feel that there is something that needs to be done. Uh, and reasonable people do disagree. This, this is going to be about climate change. Reasonable people do disagree. And this is not about you have to accept the science as if the science is a thing. But we are so often told that because climate change is the emergency, just like the COVID pandemic is the emergency, it is okay if we skip certain things like burden of proof, like scientific evidence, and go forward with the one solution that's been proposed. This is anti-scientific, it's anti-democratic, it's pro-tyranny, it's you know, all of the bad things. And here's just a particular example. So we have, um, here's an article, Zach, if you just show, show my screen briefly and then I'll, I'll pull my screen back. Uh, this is, um, Science, science news. So uh, about about some work that's being done. It's not published. It's not some research that's being published in science, but about work being done by a biotech firm. The headline is, and this is from uh, the twenty third of February, twenty twenty two. To fight climate change, a biotech firm has genetically engineered a very peppy poplar. <laughs> okay, um, and it's you know it's it's a in the voice that we have now come to expect from science journalism, even at one of the two premier science journals in the world, that's very much rah-rah. This is, this is, this is not journalism. This is advocacy, 
one. And uh, if I may have my screen back, Zach, so that I can just see what I wanted to read, what quotes I wanted to read here. Um, we have in the article, um, the, transgen the transgenic trees are growing fast. And the idea is that faster growth means faster take up of carbon dioxide, and therefore that's going to slow down climate change. That's the, that's the basic argument. Um, quote, the firm's genetically enhanced poplars grew more than 1.5 times faster than unmodified ones in lab trials. Uh, and <laughs> there's a lot to say about what's wrong with this research, and, 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 and we can go there. Uh, but we have a quote from a forest geneticist at Oregon State University, who, uh, yes, does in fact have a financial stake in this outcome being what he hopes it is. So um, there isn't even the, the pretense that there's not uh, financial incentives here. Quote from the article, Strauss, for one, believes the urgency of addressing the climate crisis outweighs potential risks associated with transgenic trees. We don't have the luxury, he says, to wait for 30 years and make sure nothing can possibly go wrong. Oh, really? Transgenic trees Yes. Now. No, they've, they've generated uh, what? Look, I mean, they sound like a bunch of dumb shits, and so probably they didn't do the work right, and that's probably what will protect us from their madness. But it sounds to me like what they tried to do was create a, a really impressive invasive species, as if we don't have a tragic invasive species problem on virtually every continent. Right. And I mean, you know, they bemoan in this article how there are rules in place that prevent, if you're going to be um, be used as a sustainable forest project, you can't, uh, product rather, you can't be genetically modified. It's like, okay, has, has anyone in this biotech firm noticed what actually naturally occurring fast growing trees true of? So let's take alder, let's take sacropia, let's take acroma, balsa, right? Like just to name three of the world's most known and widespread fast growing trees. What is true of all of them? They grow fast, they die young, right? They fall over very quickly. They're light because they are more air than structure because they grew fast because that's what they do. Yeah, there or, are trade offs that can't be avoided. Yes, or or let's take uh, eucalyptus, right? Which is absolutely devastating. Uh, forest I don't habitats. think it's particularly fast growing. Well, it's particularly invasive, and to okay. the extent that they've done their work at all, well, to the extent mm -hmm. that they are um, correct in at least arguing that this would capture a bunch of carbon out of the atmosphere, then surely what they are saying is that these are dense trees. Right, they have to be dense in order for that to work. Right. If they are, you know, like Cecropia, mostly hollow. So, just right? Cecropia is actually the one that I mentioned that may not be familiar to people. It's just it's it's uh, it is the uh, first. I primary can't think of the, yeah, the primary successional species um, in uh, in lowland tropical in lowland neotropical forests of along the with world. along with balsa. And along people, with balsa, people will know that balsa wood, right. you know, basically doesn't have as many molecules. In right, it you can like you can take you know, super light. You get you know you can get the like mini dimensional lumber in terms of balsa wood to build yeah. stuff, and you know unless it's unless it's like half by half inch, like you can just squish it, right? It's because it's that soft a wood because fast growing means soft wood right. in, general, in general. Let's say that they've got, you know, the equivalent of eucalyptus, which is a very dense hard wood, right? But nonetheless, they're talking Again, about- Again, I don't think eucalyptus is fast growing, but um, eucalyptus has a different- fast to capture habitat. Right, but it, I mean, it's got it's got a number of different tricks up its sleeve. Yep, right. It it's does. you know, it 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 withstands fire, for instance. Yes, it may start <laughs> it them starts more fire, or less, but and, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, look, the point the point is, and I and we are, you're going to have to work our way back here. But one yeah. of the the sort of themes of what we're getting at, which is actually going to link a bunch of different things together, uh, including uh, this will sound wrong, but even the. Uh, appalling thing that has now taken place in Ukraine is that in effect, we have a system in which everybody who is supposed to be telling us what we need to know has been transmuted by our economic system into a fucking salesman, which is to say a liar. Right. And sometimes they do this by lying to themselves. I mean, what salesman right, is going to invest in the precautionary principle in which they're telling you all of the reasons that actually you shouldn't be listening to them because the danger that they've missed something is so great, right? Or 
a deep investigation of the trade-offs where that salesman is now going to tell you all the downsides of the cool thing that they just tried to convince you that you need to do. And in fact, what they do instead is they hijack your amygdala or whatever it is, and they <laughs> utilize right. your fear to get you to stop thinking. Right? And that is what they have done in all of these cases. They've said, we don't have time. The emergency is too great. And therefore, you're going to have to let us get you out of this dangerous situation that you will otherwise suffer from. Yeah. And it's, it's monstrous. It's like amygdala spinal tap. <laughs> like, this one goes to 11 this and we're going to keep it at 11 on you for as long as we can. And we're going to make sure that you buy our stuff. Right. That you buy our stuff. And the fact is, this is sort of how you and I ended up in the crazy position that we're now in, right? Because the fact is you can actually check their claims and you can't check them like, no, that's wrong. But you can check them like, actually, that doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. What you just told me has a flaw in it somewhere and it's either here yeah. or it's there and here's how you know. The company is called Living Carbon and we are told in this piece uh, that's published in the news branch of Science Magazine, the journal, Living Carbon is also trying to engineer trees to take up heavy metals from degraded soils. Company leaders hope those metals could give the wood antifungal properties that will reduce its decomposition rate, enabling it to store carbon longer. That actually makes sense to me. Uh, it's not a complete analysis. They're trying to reduce decomp they have in the to. trees? They have to. They have to because what they're, what they're arguing, and frankly, I don't believe them because they are obviously victims of this thing that has replaced science it's with not, sales. Right. Right. But what they're trying to do, what they want to say is, look, the way to reduce global warming in so much, in so far as global warming is the result of too much of the ratio of carbon in our atmosphere having gotten too high. Right. What they need to do is pull that carbon out of the atmosphere in some way, and that's worthless if it gets pulled out and then returned on the decomposition. So basically, the point is, but then, but they then they're acknowledging. The they're acknowledging that they have no intention of these species being part of any ecosystem ever. Because if they are actually trying to produce trees that grow fast, presumably die young, and then lie there forever, not returning their nutrients to the earth and to the nitrogen cycle and you know, everything else, then they become yet another unforeseen problem in that ecosystem that they have created and that no one will know what to do with. Well, so, you know, if if this is just a product yeah. and if and if they could, which of course they can't, but if they could, you know, grow it in a contained manner such that it did not spread its its genetically modified seed, who knows? I don't know if it's in the germline, although plants not having the sequestered germline, probably it will be, right? Yep. Um into outside areas if they if they could basically plant these and and have them not interact in any way with any native species it's going to be i can't imagine that they possibly would and then they're hoping that it's pulling up heavy metals from what then right so they're going to rope like it, it every step you take it falls apart because they both want it to be part of the ecosystem so that it's helping you know mitigate heavy metal toxicity in soils etc uh, but also they want to then immediately you know chop those down and use them in building materials even though it's going to be softwood because it grew so fast but they don't want that return to the to the soil because of the heavy metals that they were supposedly solving the problem of i mean it's not that they haven't identified some real problems but it's like every analysis stops at exactly the point like we are told the no, analysis yeah. stops at exactly the point that it comes to the conclusion they want and this yeah. is you know this is the game That's the cdc sales. plays right the cdc is like oh we got 19 months worth of data we're going to show you two weeks right here in a particular state and that's going to that's going to reveal the pattern we like right and you know they're just th this is what is happening everywhere pick and choose the little slice of data that you like don't actually share the data but be assured here's a nice graph with you know maybe even mucked up axes and trust us we're the science so it is the mental disorder called sales that's what's happening <laughs> right the mental disorder called sales is one in which you don't actually care that your customer is better off the important mm -hmm. thing, you have succeeded yeah. at the point that your customer believes they will be better off enough that they buy the thing. And what I would argue is that 
we have been running the stupidest gain of function experiment with respect to sales in the history of the universe, right? We, by virtue of the fact that we have plugged science into the market, mm. right? Where we have basically said, oh, your science is good. Here, convince a bunch of your peers that your science is really important so that you win the funding game, right? Mm -hmm. What we do is we train people who we are supposed to be, we are supposed to be training them to be totally deaf to whether or not their conclusions are good for them, mm -hmm. right? We want you to put forward a hypothesis because it needs to be advanced and then to falsify it and to feel happy that you shot down your own hypothesis. That's what a good scientist does, right? Instead, what we do is we train scientists who may have gone into it with that instinct. We train them to be salespeople and to lie to each other, right? And then we group them into little cliques where the point is, oh, I've got a little lie that I'm going to include in my grant proposal. And then you can pick up that lie in your grant proposal and we'll each, you know, validate these lies. And the point is, how do you get to a place where the entire scientific apparatus all lies in unison, in perfect harmony about the same topic. Well, this is how you do it. Well, and I mean, it's, and it's even worse, right? Like, but, but wait, there's more, right? That, you know, we know, and, and again, Deutsch talks about this in his piece, and Goldacre talks about it in Bad Pharma, and it's, you know, it's well, it's well understood that pharmaceutical companies write papers that come to conclusions that are favorable to them, whether or not they're freaking true or not. And then they get people whom are assessed on the basis of how many publications they have to put their names on those papers. And those people whose names are on papers they did not write, whose data they have not seen that they cannot vouch for, then get all the spoils of academia. They get the they get more grant money and they get more advancement within their university and they get the accolades and then they get more papers coming to them that they did not write and cannot vouch for and probably are not true, onto which they just slap their name and so it continues. Right, and it is effectively the pharmaceutical companies having invaded academia virus-like. And then suddenly <laughs> yes. people who look like scientists are spouting pharma bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. They're partially spouting science. They're using the, you know, the terminology that they were taught to wield, but they are saying things that are pharma favorable because it, it pays their fucking rent, right? right? They are effectively infected cells inside of academia. And the problem is the public has no idea that this is taking place. But they've got the elbow patches, so it looks like self. It, exactly. <laughs> It looks it looks enough looks like, like self academia. that people buy it. And when they say, hey, be terrified, this terrifying thing is out there, right? And you know what? Here's the good news. The terrifying thing is coming to get you, but it just so happens that we have the thing that protects you from the terrifying thing. So you're welcome. Yeah. You don't need to be afraid anymore. We did have to skimp a little bit on the safety, but it's for your own good. Yeah. And then, and then the craziest part is you've got what turns out to be a relatively small number of people who are so committed to the science thing that they will continue to do it in the face of this sales game. Yeah. And what has happened to all of us, frankly, is we have been demonized and marginalized and portrayed as crazy and weird or corrupt or something. It's mm -hmm. the exact inverse of the truth. 